nourished for the day. Thank you, make fun. And we're now on our way to where are we going, Jake? Uh, Jake, <laughs> bloody Ethan. Uh, Denby, Wales. Denby. 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 Denbyshire, or Denbyshire, or just Denby, depending on what you're feeling. There we go, Denbyshire. The Shire of Dens. Uh, Understandable, to be honest. Sweaty. Oh, I feel regularly sweaty. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome to Decades, but more importantly with regards to this video, welcome to Wales, one of the four constituent countries that comprises the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Situated next to England, understandably much to the chagrin of the Welsh, and I do apologise for having to clarify that fairly common bit of information but in my experience, there are people out there who see the entirety of the British Isles and just assume that all of it is London. And I do appreciate that that is a minority when it comes to people watching this video. Anyway, to be specific, today we're in North Wales, particularly this zone, known as Denby, situated only a short drive from the town of Wrexham, which has become a household name thanks to a couple of Hollywood guys purchasing the local football team and making a documentary about it. But it is reasonable to ask, why have we come to Denby? Well, it's certainly not for this statue, though I do find it quite funny that its face is blurred on Google Maps. But no, we're not here to invade the privacy of a statue. What we're interested in is much, much older. You see, Denby's Welsh name carries the meaning of Little Fortress in reference to the subject of today's video, Denby Castle and the town's glorious walls. Combined together, these places make for a brilliant day out, provided you're close enough. And though I can appreciate that this intro segment is dragging, there is one last bit of admin to get through. This is Jack, and he's the reason we're here, a resident of Denby for the past decade as well as a viewer slash supporter of both Decades and my main channel. Via the magical internet, he invited us down to his home to explore its fascinating, rich history. And I just couldn't say no. So thank you, Jack, for being a magnificent guide. This video is for you. This also marks the first time the three of us here at Decades have managed to get on location together. So it's arguably a special moment for us. Please enjoy. Originally, this region of Wales was known as Parvedula, meaning heartland, apparently. And I understand that to the average Welsh-speaking viewer, my pronunciation is going to be laughable, but let me try. This region was dominated by a patrimony that asserted control over the farming lands on the Denby Moors, which is turf fought over between the Welsh and Normans from as early as the mid-11th century and into the 12th. This land would be granted to Welsh Prince David ap Gruffudd by the English King Edward I in 1277, as a byproduct of their allegiance during David's conflict with his brother Llewellyn. On this site, a fortification of some description was constructed, however there are no real surviving details of it. However, the Welsh Prince would not retain the land for very long, when he would find himself back in the favour of Llewellyn. Come 1282, Duffid and Llewellyn would rebel against the English King, prompting Edward to mobilise a large army and invade North Wales, and following a whole month besieged, the site of Denby Castle would fall to English control by October of 1282, the end result being Edward gaining a significant foothold in the Welsh Marchlands, and the conflict would result in the Welsh princes becoming significantly dead. And this is where the story of the Stones Around Us began. 
Denby Castle was initially established here over 700 years ago in the late 13th century by King Edward I of England, also known as Edward Longshanks, a prolific commenter here on decades, but I suppose that's besides the point. Edward I is known for many things, and one of them is perhaps his conquest here in Wales, and the erection of an impressive network of castles that now dot the landscape. Edward was responsible for, or at least aided in the erection or repairs of some 17 castles in Wales, and Denby was one of them. These castles' purpose was to overwhelm the resisting Welsh princes and bring the country under the rule of the English. These powerful structures, though often only shadows of their former selves, beam their might and strength to the surrounding landscape for all to see even today. So it's likely that Edward's intended message was loud, clear and unlikely to be misinterpreted. This land was his purely because he's strong enough to take it. In Denby Castle's case, it was established to control the Lordship of Denby, following Edward's conquest of the region. The lands would be granted to Henry de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln, among many other pompous titles, to conduct construction as Edward shifted his conquest towards Snowdonia. De Lacy would commence construction on a new walled town here alongside the castle, one largely inhabited by English people, an effort that wouldn't even manage to see completion before the Welsh kicked off again with the Madog at Llewellyn Revolt of 1294, when the castle would be seized momentarily contributing to the subsequent improvements of the surrounding defences no doubt. Furthermore, the castle and defences would still not be completed by 1311, when Henry de Lacy passed away. It's at this point that the castle would be juggled between owners a fair bit before landing under the control of a powerful family known as the Mortimers. The Mortimers were medieval magnates and marcher lords, effectively English nobility appointed by the monarch to protect the border between England and Wales, known as the Welsh Marches. The Mortimer family, upon reacquiring the lordship of the land following some political turbulence, let's say closer to the start of the 14th century, would conduct repairs on the fortifications starting from 1355, going into the next five decades. Denby would be raided in 1400 by Owen Glinder's forces during his revolt against the crown, at which point Edmund Mortimer, the Earl of March, was only a child. So a knight named Henry Percy would be placed in charge of the castle by King Henry IV, though during the course of this rebellion he would defect in the year 1403. Yet despite this, Denby remained under royal control throughout the rebellion until its end in 1407. Edmund Mortimer would continue to hold the castle until 1425, at which point he passed away aged only 33 years with no heir, meaning the castle would find its way into the portfolio of the third Duke of York, Richard Plantagenet, a man of royal descent. During the Wars of the Roses, fought between 1455 and 1487, Denby was fought over by both the Lancastrian and Yorkist forces, and while the castle was held by Yorkist forces for the most part, Henry VI had put Jasper Tudor in the role of constable of the castle, the uncle of the man who would become King Henry VII. Jasper would eventually force the garrison held there to surrender in 1460 following a Lancastrian victory at the rout of Ludford Bridge in October of the previous year, a confrontation that largely went without blood spilled. Denby would then be recaptured in 1461 by Yorkist Sir Richard Herbert. Jasper Tudor wouldn't be kept away for long however, returning to Denby in 1468 burning the town within the walls, resulting in many who lived there relocating to the new suburbs surrounding them. The castle and its inner walls would largely be deserted and ruinous by the early 16th century. That said, the castle became the administrative centre for the county of Denbyshire during the 1530s. Despite this, little would be done just yet to restore the site. In 1563, Robert Dudley, the yet-to-be Earl of Leicester, would be granted lease of the castle. During his time in control, the castle would see use imprisoning those deemed to be traitors to the crown. The most famous prisoner perhaps being Richard Gwyn, also known as Richard White. Gwyn was a Welsh Roman Catholic teacher who taught at illegal schools during the time of Queen Elizabeth I, a Protestant monarch. So you can imagine how that went down. 
He would be held here in Denby Castle before he was executed in Wrexham on the 15th of October 1584 via the means of being hanged, drawn and quartered, making him a martyr. His four quarters would be displayed in Wrexham, Ruthen Castle, Holt Castle and here at Denby Castle. Richard Gwynne would be canonised by Pope Paul VI in 1970, officially recognising him as a saint. Back to the timeline for now though. Robert Dudley had ambitions for Denby. Desiring to bring city status to the town, he began work on a church seemingly with hopes to transform it into a cathedral. It became known as Leicester's Church and would never see completion due to the project running out of funding. Upon Dudley's death, any hopes for its completion went along with it, left partially constructed as something of an instant ruin. And anything that could have been stripped and repurposed was. Moving on to 1642, the first English civil war broke out with North Wales siding with the Royalists. Denby Castle would sustain a garrison of some 500 men under the command of Colonel William Salisbury, at which point repairs would be undertaken to the castle's defences. In 1645, following Charles I's defeat at Roughton Heath in Cheshire, he would spend a few days here at Denby. A royalist army would amass in Denby near the ruined friary a month following this monumental defeat, commanded by a man named Sir William Vaughan. With the intent on relieving the forces besieged in Chester, however, Vaughan would be defeated by parliamentarian forces under the command of Major General Thomas Mitton, the High Sheriff of Shropshire resulting in a portion of the royalist forces retreating to the safety of Denby Castle. Mitten could claim the outer portions of the town, however, he could not break into the walled portion of the town, meaning the castle was also out of his reach. In April of the following year, 1646, Mitten would return to Denby better equipped, resulting in a siege. The Goblin Tower, along with the walls, would be smashed with artillery. Colonel William Salisbury, still in command of the Royalist garrison at Denby, without the prospect of reinforcements, would be forced to negotiate the surrender of the castle, with an agreement finally being met on the 26th of October that year. With Salisbury's agreed departure, the Parliamentarian forces would install a garrison of their own within the castle, led by Colonel George Twistleton as the castle's new governor, a position he would hold until May of 1660. During the early days of Twistleton's tenure, the castle would see use holding political prisoners. In 1648, the Royalists would attempt to rescue the castle's inmates, however, the plan would fail. A good decade later, in 1659, a Royalist and Presbyterian uprising against the Commonwealth Government led by a man named Sir George Booth would result in Denby's castle momentarily being seized in August. However, Booth would see defeat at the Battle of Winnington Bridge, often referred to as the last battle of the English Civil War, only a few weeks later, resulting in the surrender of the rebels and the government reclaiming control of the castle. Both would eventually be captured and imprisoned at the Tower of London, but as far as imprisonment goes, it wouldn't be an awfully long stay. Anyhow, soon following this uprising, the castle here would be slighted. Slighting for the uninitiated is where a fortification in particular is damaged in such a way that its military function is rendered impotent. In Denby's case, parts of the curtain walls and a couple of towers would see demolition, at which point the site would be left to fall into ruin with stone being repurposed in other construction work. The slighting of castles was a fairly common occurrence following the English Civil War and the intent was to prevent further uprisings such as that of Booth, who, like I said, didn't have too much time to put his feet up imprisoned at the Tower of London. The Stuart monarchy would be restored in 1660, and as a result, Booth would be liberated. From this point onward, the castle's history would grow somewhat quiet, besides from some ownership disputes resulting in it reverting to the crown by the end of the 1600s. Denby would remain a ruin despite developments occurring within the walled town in the 18th century. As for the modern situation here at Denby, the castle is run by Cadbu, which translates to keep apparently, the Welsh government's historic environment service. Denby today is a fascinating site, as I find most castles to be, situated atop a naturally defended rocky outcrop affording delicious views of the landscape. You can't help but like it.
Now, you can't have a grade 1 listed historical structure like this and not happen upon some legends mixed in nicely with the history. And like every other old anything ever, Denby Castle is also supposedly haunted, and Jack was more than happy to tell us all about the legends the castle holds that he knows about, and though I'm no firm believer in the paranormal, I was more than happy to listen. And it seems a lot of these legends do focus around the perhaps appropriately named Goblin Tower. The castle maker and the original person who laid the foundation of the castle, they both had a son and they were playing on the walls and the son fell off the walls and died with the castle maker's son. Um, and there's a legend that sometimes people have said they've seen apparitions of uh, the kids around the windows and seeing somebody fall off the walls and making it crying and stuff. Is there a legend behind the well? Uh, no. <laughs> there's, one, there's a legend behind the one in the castle. Oh, right, okay. I don't wish to climb Well, if, the, if we find it locked on the other way, on the return trip, we'll have to jump. Yeah. Yeah, well, it looks like it's about two feet deep tops, if, if even, it's a puddle. There'll be broken legs. Right, is that the, is that the, be the end there? Yeah, it's the end. Oh, look, we're in Bethlehem. <laughs> We've come a long way. If you look closely into the water, it's him. It's the face of Jesus. That's it, it's Christ. In a random one in Denby. That's it, it's the eighth coming of Christ. We found Christ. Yeah, in Denby. It's actually an apparition of Bishop Len Brennan's face on the screen. <laughs> <That's board. laughs> yeah! Stairs! We love stairs. Stairs, yeah! <laughs> stairs. We heard you the first time. Why do we go to castles with stairs? they all have stairs. <laughs> it does seem we were too busy being juvenile to get any meaningful to camera pieces for Jack, I apologise mate, but like he touched down upon before, there is a story of the castle builder Henry de Lacy's son playing on the scaffolding here at the Goblin Tower where he fell to his death, and his ghost can supposedly be encountered here in the form of the apparition of a face. And then there's the obligatory white lady who seems to get about a bit between castles. I'd imagine the anecdote changes based on who tells the story. Anyhow, the broad strokes of the story is that the white lady was a woman who dropped her infant child into the well accidentally, somehow, causing her child's demise and her grief keeps her here, perpetually grieving forever. Perhaps the most outlandish that I could find online was the legend of a dragon that was slain here and now haunts the site forevermore. Yeah, I think that one would be quite hard to not notice. But this is Wales, so that story could derive from taking some heavy gear and then simply looking at the flag. It seems Denby Castle has a reputation as one of the most haunted castles in North Wales and perhaps even the whole of Wales, so regardless of whether or not you believe in ghosts, it's a point worthy of enough respect to not go entirely amiss. Even if none of it has any factual basis, if ghosts aren't real and it's all fantasy and imagination gone nuts, the actual building inspires that imagination, and that's what makes the story perhaps more enchanting, irrespective of one's ability to suspend their own disbelief. It's a valid layer to Denby Castle's truly breathtaking character. But that's not all the character this town has. It's got charm around every corner, and a little. And you really can't argue with a little. There's plenty to explore and see here, I don't really know where to begin. There is a love lane, but it's a tad too populated for any funky business. That said, it wouldn't stop Jones. There's also the old friary down this little track at the opposite end of the town. It's about as old as the castle itself, but since the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII in the 16th century, all that's truly left behind are the walls. There are a few other interesting places here, but I did notice something incredibly concerning. There are too many places named Jones. So now Jones thinks that Denby is secretly a site dedicated to the worship of him. But maybe it secretly is, I don't know. Erect underneath it says Jones! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> but no day trip is complete without checking out the local boozer. We were going to visit one of Denby's local chippies, but you'd hope Jones's appetite would be decidedly neutralised following consuming this monstrosity for breakfast. So he settled for visiting the Guildhall Tavern, a pub with notable history of its own. Formerly known as the Bull Hotel, the Guildhall Tavern occupies a building that dates back as far as the 17th century. 
And as far as going somewhere for a swig is concerned, I love when the building I'm in has its own story to tell, and that was certainly the case here. And that brings today's little journey to a conclusion. Denby is a fascinating place, positively dripping with history. It's all over the place, it surrounds you, and when you're here, that is quite literally the case. When you're in Denby, you're never far from a point of interest, whether that be a statue, a ruin, or simply a building still in use. They even have stocks, and that's pretty cool. It's not the only place like it in the world, in fact, far from it, quite the opposite. There are many places out there steeped in rich history that surrounds you at every turn. And what makes all these places unique from one another are the stories they tell and the combinations used to tell them. And the bittersweet reality is these places exist the world over, and there probably won't be enough time in our lives to see them all. But thanks to Jack contacting us, we can at the very least say that we've been to Denby, and hopefully we've done it justice. But the truth is, maybe a video simply never can. Regardless, our day trip has come to an end. And Connor got to drive my car home, which was really kind of weird actually. But don't worry, he is insured and that might just be the only time you'll ever feel sympathy for an insurance company. Thank you for watching today's video. Have a happy new year, and with any luck, we'll be seeing you all in 2024. Until then, take care, and goodbye. As you may know, that many castles are in Wales, courtesy of the English. And I think since decades goes to Wales frequently, we need to understand some essential Welsh phrases. We have a list of 10 must-know phrases essential to survival in the magical land of Wales. I mean, you have one phrase which is Darin Carri Praedin, which roughly translates to Hello Wales. And then you have the good old Yiddish Chich Wadid. I can't even bother pronouncing that. Right, we're going to try that one again. Eich man, we love our mothers. Do you I dim why it sail say oh Wales said we've got to leave. Why? We've learnt the key phrases.